everybody. I just wanted to check in and say a few words about some news stories that have been making the rounds recently about a crisis in archaeology, more specifically a labor crisis in archaeology. More specifically still, actually, the convergence of several different types of labor crises in archaeology happening right now and how that's created both some serious tragedies uh, and also potentially some opportunities for really needed change in the industry. Really, the things that have made the news recently, rightfully, have been safety related. Particularly last year, there was the tragic death of Kaylin Gerke, who was a young archaeologist working uh, in the industry for the first time, who died of heat related injuries. More recently, in the last couple of weeks, there's been news stories coming out of the Miami Tequesta site, uh, which is a CRM archaeology project uh, that has had um, uh, archaeologists being exposed to dangerous chemicals including arsenic and tungsten and mercury, as well as others. Uh, so some serious health, long-term health concerns being raised there. Now, I don't want to spend today calling out any particular firms or any particular people within the industry, because I actually think the underlying problems and related opportunities are industry-wide issues. They really aren't related to a specific firm. Some firms are better than others. Some are, are infamous within the industry. So let me take a little step back for those of you who are listening who maybe don't know about CRM or what CRM even is. CRM stands for Cultural Resource Management, and it is a, a private industry of archaeology. It employs you know, something like 95 plus percent of archaeologists working in North America. It's driven by a couple of laws. I won't get into it too deeply here because maybe actually that's another subject for another video to really just talk to you about just this subject. What is CRM and what does it do? Where does it come from? But it's driven by a couple of laws in the United States uh, that protect cultural heritage. Uh, they work a little bit like environmental laws that protect, say, like wetlands. So they're designed to protect historical places, landscapes, uh, uh, cultural patrimony, uh, artifacts and sites. Whenever there's uh, large projects that need to be done related to infrastructure, for instance, uh, archaeologists are hired as a part of a CRM firm to come in and do survey and see if there are any sites that need to be found and somehow be protected or mitigated or excavated. My relation to this industry is uh, long and, and complex. I worked in CRM for years when I was younger uh, as never above the level of what you might call a shovel bum, right? Sort of an intro level, uh, bachelor's level sort of position, uh, which uh, interestingly is uh, of the types of people who are definitely in the most danger uh, for the kind of labor problems that I'm talking about here. I worked for private firms. I worked for a, a, a tribal nation as internal CRM firm. I worked for university affiliated uh, research groups that did CRM. So I've, I've worked in the industry quite a lot, but at that lower level, I've never been in a management position. I've never been in a PI, a primary investigator position. Now, obviously now I'm an educator, I'm a professor and I, and I teach students archaeology, uh, but I work at a, a, a small teaching focused and, and uh, uh, let's, let's call it sort of professional oriented university. So most most of my students that study archaeology end up going into CRM. So I am training a lot of the students who will become members of this labor force in the next few years. So that's why I care so much about this issue because I care about my students and I want to protect them as they go into this industry. Rightfully so, as I said, the safety issues are the ones that have gotten the most attention recently. But there are actually broader labor issues that have been around for a long time in this industry. Folks working in CRM, especially at the bachelor's level, tend to get paid not well, considering the level of educational expectations that they have. So it's, it's expected that you have both a bachelor's degree and field experience, laboratory experience, uh, and specialized skills, uh, and, and but, are, but most folks at this level are paid quite poorly. Uh, despite that, CRM jobs often have serious work precarity. So firms often, as a nature of how the industry works, again, I don't want to call it specific firms here, but we'll hire folks on seasonally and then lay them off in the winter. The job requires often serious travel. So a lot of CRM archaeologists don't really live at home. They have to travel for the week or weeks at a time and live in hotels on per diem, um, maybe sometimes hundreds of miles away from their home base. Uh, and all these things effectively actually create uh, and, and exacerbate the existing diversity problems within the industry of archaeology because all those issues uh, hit uh, the types of communities who have traditionally been iced out of archaeology, uh, it hits them harder, right? And I see this with my students a lot because most of my students do fit 
uh, that sort of demographic profile. And, and so many of them have been unable to really get into this industry because they can't live far away from home because they have to take care of family members or they have children. Uh, they really can't afford to take that low of pay. Uh, they can't, they can't deal with that precarity, right? They don't have a, a backup to help them get through the winter if they get laid off, right? Which is just something you sort of are supposed to expect within CRM. That's, that exacerbates what's already an existing terrible diversity problem within archaeology. Now here's where we get to the potential opportunities. Right now, there is a different type of labor crisis already happening in CRM, and it's just going to get bigger over the next several years to uh, a decade or so, especially because of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Those types of projects pretty much always require CRM surveys. So the firms are desperate for labor. They are looking for people who can do this work, who have the training. And that is putting pressure on the industry in ways that are uh, uh, you know, dangerous for the industry as a, as a whole. We have educational pipeline problems. We've got all kinds of problems we need to solve in the next 10 years to make sure that the industry simply doesn't collapse uh, under its own weight. Uh, but we also have opportunities there for labor, for, for folks working at those entry-level positions and up through the ranks of CRM, right? That gives you power uh, if there is this high demand for your labor. I will say for folks like me, for educators out there, know that these are, into, these are issues I think you really need to educate yourself about if you're not already. I mean, many, many archaeology educators certainly know about these issues, but some don't, right? Especially if you're not like an, uh, an archaeologist who works in North America. You're still probably training folks who are going to go into CRM. So educate yourself as much as you can about the industry, how it works, what kinds of labor uh, of challenges and and uh, and disparities exist within this industry? What can your students expect going into this industry? How can they insulate themselves as much as possible from those challenges uh, and prepare themselves? And also, how can they know about the ways in which they might be able to value their own labor going forward? So there's been discussions on Twitter and elsewhere in the last few days about what seems like a perennial question in archaeology is, how do archaeologists actually solve these problems, these labor problems? Uh, and, and I mean, for me, I, I don't know a, a step forward that doesn't involve unionization or some other kind of labor solidarity. Uh, and, and there's specific challenges for that because of the precarity of labor in CRM, because people often don't work for a single firm. They move around throughout their career. The idea of creating a labor union associated with a specific firm. Most firms are small shops. They don't have huge numbers of workers. So they're not sort of traditional places where you would expect labor unions to emerge. So some kind of a lessons we can learn from other industries like ours um, that have found success in unionization, maybe regionally or, uh, or or even nationally. You might be in a union. I know I am. I get tremendous benefits from being part of AAUP. Uh, and I've, I've worked <laughs> in non-union jobs and I've worked in union jobs throughout my career. And uh, and there's there's no competition which ones have been better. Uh, the ones where I'm in a union are, are always better. And I have better protections and I get paid better. And I, and it's, and I have it's just better in just about every way. And my last thing I'll say again is directed towards my fellow uh, sort of PhD level archaeology educators recognize the solidarity that we have to have with the early career archaeologists, younger archaeologists, uh, and uh, archaeologists from traditionally discriminated against communities, uh, and just uh, a working class background archaeologists who are trying to get into this industry that we love, and this business that we love, and this science that we love, uh, and and they, they can't do it because of these labor problems. So we got to increase our labor solidarity across these these arbitrary boundaries within our industry, right? The whole idea of academic versus private archaeology, right? We got to bust down those barriers uh, because of supporting each other is only going to benefit everybody. It's going to rise all ships. So that's all I have for today. I just wanted to make a couple of comments about this. Uh, obviously, right now in the news, these, these health and safety concerns are things that need to be solved immediately. Like we really need to make steps on that right now. But I think over the coming years and even decade to decades, uh, there are going to be some, uh, we, we can start to tackle some of these broader issues as well uh, and, and hopefully improve the industry for, for all people and all workers and all archaeologists. Thanks everybody.